So Rania Friedman is a fifth grade teacher at the Jordan Jackson Elementary School in Mansfield, Massachusetts, and she's currently working on her doctorate through Northeastern. Rania is, Rania is president of MassQ, and he has been presenting at the annual conference since 2010. She's a Google, she's a Google level two certified educator, a BrainPuff certified educator, Flipbrick ambassador, Fable Vision ambassador, and Walklet ambassador. Rania, Rania, Rania has presented for ISTE, EPTEC Teacher, Tech and Learning, Menfield Digital Learning Day, BFETC, BLPC, and BLC. So welcome to Rina. Thank you very much for all of you being here. And thank you, Rina, for being here with us, despite it's very late night there on the other uh, side of the world. Very yeah, thank you, Rebecca, for that gracious introduction. Okay. Yes, I, I am Raina Friedman and it's I worked this morning and I'm 12 hours behind you. So it's actually 1 a.m. here for those of you that are out in via, the Vietnam area. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I've done a lot of presenting about how to do some progressive things in the classroom. So I'm really excited to talk about blogging and podcasting with students. And if you're at my other session, one of the things I do tell people before I start, because it's the only time I ever have an audience that needs to know this, get your colons checked. Um, I had no idea I was living with colon cancer for a decade. I just went through six months of chemotherapy and am a sur surviving at the current moment, but I had no idea that one in four people were going to be diagnosed with this. So just, I always like to tell people, be mindful of that because it's affecting young people. And one of the things I have blogged and podcasted about is exactly that. And so what I'm gonna be spending about half of the time this morning is talking about blogging and then half of the time talking about podcasting. I'm also the type of presenter that encourages you to unmute yourself and ask questions as I go. Um, you can put it in the chat. I know Rebecca said she would be sort of watching that, but feel free to obviously stop me and ask questions, interrupt. I'm happy to talk to you. So I'm going to share my screen. Can you see that? Perfect. All right. So I teach fifth grade and my fifth graders are using digital tools to share their voice with the world through blogging and podcasting. Giving them choice and voice provides them with an opportunity to reach a global audience, sharing their passions with the world. Students go through the writing process, working collaboratively and creatively with others, and the ownership and pride students have when seeing their projects come to life is electric. I put the link in the chat of this presentation, and I have my contact information and where to find me on Twitter as well. If you ever want to connect or have questions after this presentation, don't hesitate to reach out. Right, I need to move you all. All right, so here we go. Blogging. Do, 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 do. Yes, they can. Elementary student bloggers. Do, 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 do. Links to ours. So before we begin, some of the things that student blogging covers is the SAMR model because we're redefining what technology allows us to do that we couldn't have done before. It can hit any of, in the states we use what's called the common core standards. So if you have standards, it hits so many standards in the content areas. It hits the ISTE student standards. And if you're familiar with Webb's depth of knowledge, we're looking at level three and four when the kids are blogging as far as extending their strategic thinking and short-term strategic thinking versus the level one of like recall basic facts. It's really this higher level thinking skills. And if you have time on your own, and I put links to all of these things in case you wanna learn more about them, if you click on the picture. So I had been blogging for a while and it dawned on me, why can't my students, like what, why can't they become bloggers? And I happened to read a little bit from Catlin Tucker and she said, the more I let go and allow my students to drive the learning, the more rewarding and less exhausting my job is. My students are more motivated to learn because they play an active role in defining what the learning looks like. So I decided to take that and see where it would go. That was kind of my mantra. So when I thought about having students blog, I know that kids are passionate and wanna use their voice. They're curious about their world. Everyone has a story to tell. We all have things we wanna learn. Everybody has opinions to share. 
And then I started a toy with, if when I want students to blog in my lesson design, do I wanna keep it public or do I wanna keep it private? And I actually spoke to parents, school leadership and the students. And what, I, what we all came to the same conclusion of is if we wanna create a global audience where students have a voice and see themselves as agents of change, then it's gotta be public. And so my school approved the site and in the fall parents sign off on um, and that the kids can be on any school approved site. So when parents sign off, my kids actually have permission to blog. And then I ask the kids if they wanna post their blog publicly. So it really is the student's choice to be public and all of them eventually say yes. In fact, this year I had a couple kids say no at the beginning and then said, no, I want you to publish it because I wanna see what happens. So it was kind of neat to see. So we do make it public and then we have a um, parent curriculum night. And at that parent night in September, it's about two weeks in, I actually explained to parents what they've signed off on and ask if any of them want to change their mind because I'm like, your kid's going to be blogging. Your kid's voice is going to be on a podcast. Your kid's going to be on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook should they choose. So it was a lot of things that gets into the digital citizenship as well. And there's a link about that. But the blogging really got into some digital citizenship things about protecting privacy as well and keeping things safe, which has been great for kids to learn. You know, you don't share location, you don't share your last name, you don't tell people where you went. So it's been interesting. And then I looked at access and equity because pre-pandemic, not every student had a computer and access to Wi-Fi. I mean, post-pandemic, it's been a little bit easier because the school has been providing a lot. So any student that didn't have a computer at home was able to handwrite it, and then we would type it later in school. So there was always an option for kids who didn't have devices to still be able to blog. And honestly, I even typed for kids as well. I, have, I had some special ed kids in the past that had trouble formulating thoughts, but could tell me their thoughts. So they created a Google Doc, they shared it with me, so student ownership on the child and then they watched me type what they were saying. So it gets into a lot of access and equity pieces. So blogging gives a venue for our youngest students because they can express themselves through writing and video for a global audience. And they have a desire to do this, but it needs to be awakened, inspired and taught. It's like students don't know that they love to blog until they blog because they have no idea what it is, right? Like I didn't know I was gonna love to present until I presented. I mean, you don't know what you don't know until you do it. So I started to look at the standards because I wanted to, you know, I had to say to principals, I wasn't doing the regular spelling homework. This is where this all stemmed from. So I was proving that it hit all of these things, which was great. So my first brilliant idea using our school website, and this is going back, my kids have probably been blogging almost a decade, but the last couple of years, I really refined it. So I found a lesson plan on Scholastic. You know, you Google like blogging for kids and Scholastic comes up. And then I discussed with kids like what comments were underneath a blog. And this was year one. Don't worry, it gets better. Then we looked at the comments and coded them for like kindness and what types of comments people were doing. I don't know why I thought to do this. And then I reviewed Scholastic blogging rules like you can't put your last name in what I was saying. You don't put your address. You keep it like to 200 to 300 words. I mean, it's not this like gigantic thing. So we went over these rules and then I gave them a blog topic. I wonder if it will open. Yes, here it is. So here's the topic I gave them to blog about. If you could have one of the superpowers listed below, which would you choose and why? And I gave them a list. And I said, begin your post by clearly explaining the superpower you chose and thoroughly explain your choice. And I should tell you, I'm pretty sure this was with third grade. I've taught third, fourth, and fifth grade, and I started my blogging with third graders. And then once you've posted your response, please read and reply thoughtfully to at least two members. Because I was trying to teach them, you know, a decade ago how to have an online conversation. So this is what, what we did. It was an epic failure like totally bombed. I don't know what to write about. I don't know how to start it. I don't like those superpowers. <sighs> so then I had an epiphany. As an alternative to regular spelling homework sheets, I decided to offer a student blogging option as a choice now. So I wasn't gonna make them all do it. Because I see homework as an extension of the students' lives. It should be something they want to do and not a chore to complete in order to play. 
And it gives students, I felt blogging gave students a safe place for them to share their ideas and feeling like they're part of this global community. And it also would have empowered them to build their confidence in reading, writing, and communication skills. So then I come up, this is year two, with this wonderful idea of this Wonderopolis blog. Now I made this packet, please do not tell Wonderopolis I violated every copyright law known to man because who knew about copyright law back then? So I make, my kids think they're secret agents um, training for the student sector of the FBI. So I make this packet and I take pages from Wonderopolis and I tell kids they're now hired as a Wonderopolis blogger. And I told them that they're gonna be exploring Wonderopolis and then blogging about what they explore. These post expectations were taken from the scholastic guide I had from year one. And then I had gone over this like sketch note from Sylvia Duckworth about why kids were blogging. And then I went over the safety from Scholastic's things and what quality work is from Scholastic things. So I'm thinking this is gonna work, right? Because now they're choosing the article from Wonderopolis. I am not telling them what to blog about. This is all choice. And they were accessing a safe and confined space. I had copyright issues, and but students love learning new things from Wonderopolis, but I still was not giving them a voice. I was not letting them choose things on their own. They still didn't have their own voice. And what started happening is students were asking me if they could choose their blog topic. So I went from, here's what you're blogging about, to research on a website, to kids driving this now and saying, I want to write my own thing, is that okay? Over a two to three year period. That's genius. Yes, trust the kids. So now what I did is I started give tracking data of how many kids chose what assignment each week. So the blue was the regular spelling, like when the kids would write words like three times and write sentences in alphabetical order. The red is the blogging and I had this photo journal type of assignment where kids could take pictures of their spelling words. Obviously that lasted two weeks and that was it. Because look at what happened with the red. When the kids started to be able to have their choice and write what they want, they all wanted to start blogging. I still had kids that chose the regular spelling, but the data speaks for itself. So in year three, I started to really figure this out. I referred to our school responsibility use policy. So I went over with the kids, instead of blogging rules, the responsible ways to be using digital tools. And the kids and I talked all about what it's like to be a responsible user. So if your school has a policy, I think it's great if you can go over it with them. Then we viewed and discussed other student blogs. So I found models. Then I made a direction packet on my own, no copyright law. And as long as you give me credit, you can use any of my guides. So I talked about how they have the potential to be a digital leader and it's my job to help them leave a positive digital footprint. And I gave them a bunch of things that they could blog about ending with, you could write, you do your own idea. Just because some kids who said they got stuck, these helped with the topics. And then I changed the post expectations to two to 350 words because I was teaching fourth and fifth graders at this point, but nothing more than 350 words because trust me, you as the educator aren't going to want to be reading all of the blogs longer than that. We talked about the language to use, sensory details, and then I talked about how to create it. And this was actually before we were like an official Google school, actually. My kids had Google accounts from their families. That's how I got around this. So they could make their Google Doc, they could share it with me, they had to give their blog a name. I said you could use links, images, and videos, and then I was going to post it. And I left the safety and quality of work to go over because I still felt that was important, and I left the picture. So I've sort of started creating my own thing just to kind of show you what I was doing. And I gave them that list. And then now it's evolved into a shorter intro, a bunch of topics that kids came up with, a convince us blog, a discover something, writing about your favorite place, evaluating a tech tool and discussing it, or your own idea that no longer needs to get checked by the teacher because I trust my kids. Post expectations stayed the same, except I tell them don't put you know, emojis or text language like LOL because this is a professional blog. 
Um, and I told them if they were using an exclamation point, only use one, not like a whole row of them. And so what they're doing is they, they're using a Google Doc to type their blog. If they want to make a vlog, like a video blog, they still have to type a script. The reason I asked them for that is because a video blog is going up on YouTube and our blogging site, it needs to be ADA and has to be closed captioned. So if they type out their blog post, you as the educator can just put that text in so YouTube can close caption it and everything's spelled correctly based on the kid and then you're not typing it or doing it for the child, which is great. So they have the option now to do a Google Doc or a Screencastify video or a format of their choosing. I had kids blog using and put Google Forms to get data from a global audience. I had kids use slides and sites and embed it into their blog, or maybe they have their own ideas. They have to give their blog a title. Now, it used to be that I had the kids create a blog every week and share the blog with me in a Google Doc, a new one. Don't do that. That is like getting 18 million documents every week for the rest of the year. It was too much. So what I did this year was, is I created a template just like this and shared it in Google Classroom and the kids write all their blogs in one document. So everything's in one place, which is great. I have a lot of tabs, sorry. They can, I taught them how to do hyperlinks, images. They could use the doing gap if they want. I gave them the same thing. Now I said, your blog will need to be mostly 100% free of errors before it's posted. We will work on it together using comments until it is fifth grade ready. I don't expect it to be perfect, they're 10 and 11, but it's gotta be fifth grade ready. So it's gotta have its capitals and some punctuation, but they might not have all the commas because they don't know all that yet. Our classroom community will be able to comment on each blog too in Google Classroom. They also can comment online because we use Blogger. Again, the safety and the quality of work. So the direction packet has changed. So how do we make this happen? So they use the Google Doc to create their blog. That affords an opportunity for online conversation and feedback. And what that looks like, just so that way you can see. Is I haven't checked this one yet. He did it early. But if you look, you see all my feedback on the right. And I do this with each child. I just go through it. And what my kids over the years have said is, Miss Friedman, you would write compound sentence, comma missing, and then you'd stop and it would just say compound sentence. And if I forgot, I actually had to go Google what that was. So they're actually using and teaching themselves skills that I didn't even realize they were learning, which was kind of neat. So just, I do a lot of grammar, a lot about their ideas. So he's, you know, he's doing video games. He did puzzles. And the one he's got coming up next week is all about the weather. And his grandmother helps him. So it's kind of fun to hear like the family connection. And we work together during the week. I do ask students that if they put photos and get do a nonfiction piece that they have to cite their sources. Um, we've used creative commons and searching or personal photos for images because I actually teach kids about how the fact that you just can't go on Google and take any image, we don't have the right to do that. You actually either, have, I teach them to either look at the usage rights when they do a Google search or use creative commons or take their own picture. But it's got to be a picture that we have the right to take. If they take a picture it need, that I'm not, they're not sure about, they actually have to put the source. So they're learning these digital citizenship skills from the get-go. Um, they can create videos and embed links. I am the one with the blog. The kids don't have the blog. What I do is, is I'll take his post once it's fifth grade ready. I'll copy and paste it and put it right into Blogger. So it makes it very easy. And then I publish it and give it a real world experience because it's shared on our, I have a professional Facebook, a professional Twitter, so it goes there so that, and we use hashtags. The kids will tell me who to tag and do hashtags. So this we have is the rug problem about a student whose apartment got flooded. So he wrote all about the fact of what they had to do when this rug got flooded and how they had to stay out of the apartment and how many of us have had like 
home emergencies and can relate to that. Just to show you. This one wrote a fiction story about a dog that got it, that attacked. So we're exploring fiction. I have one that, and they have a blog due twice a month. So I have one that every um, one he does is a new day when he was at Disney World because this trip was important to him. What I normally do in the winter. So you can see there's just, what is Roblox? He loves playing Roblox. So there's just such a diverse interest. This one about the taco man or the clucky chicken. She was writing about her chickens. And this one wrote about how he got chickens. Now those two didn't talk about how they were writing chickens. It was just random, but they did that. And you'll notice at the top, it says by hashtag agent eight. So my kids are secret agents training for training for the student sector, the FBI. When I do their hashtags like that, when I share it on social media, their names are never used in a post at the top. So when I do it at Twitter, it just says this. Now I do give them credit. They put their names at the bottom, but that way their name isn't the one going out on social media. Just to show you that. So we reach a global audience because I'm emailing it to parents who then forward it to grandparents, aunts, uncles, and I don't know who. Um, it's put on our Facebook page, our Twitter feed. It's got the hashtags of the students. They can think about the at symbol. One thing I've done is if you've ever read, um, Peter Reynolds is a local author around here and he and I are very friendly and he has a local bookstore called The Blue Bunny and he gave me the original Blue Bunny. So pre-pandemic, the ceramic Blue Bunny went home with a child who wanted to blog about the adventures of the Blue Bunny and they wrote in the perspective of the bunny. And the same thing with this Captain Allergic blog, someone had made me this like stuffed bug and it was like a flat Stanley type of project where the bug was gonna travel to different homes. So the kids wrote about, it's weak with Captain Allergic. So one of my kids was talking and I put this in here about something I like about Google Classroom is we're an online community because blogging made them feel like that. We use Google Classroom to share our blog because it's linked right here. We have this whole blog workspace, which let me just get out of here. Let me move that. So here we have the what we have our blog link there and the blog post and the kids can read them. And then what you'll see is it says no comments here, but some kids do have comments. Like this says one comment. So I get emailed about the comments. And then what I do is, is I forward this to the students. So that way I can say, hey, someone commented on your blog. So that way it's a, it's a nice safe thing. And notice it says unknown because it's probably one of my kids and they can't log into this. It just shows up as unknown which is kind of nice. And one of my students was an uncle and this was the most read blog I think anyone's ever done because his mom shared it with everybody and their mother, which was kind of nice for him. He was very excited. So I allow students to read and comment. It still gives us an opportunity to teach comments. I show this YouTube video from Lindy Yolis that talks about how to comment with students. It, lead, ooh, it leads to great discussions. And it's, we've made the leap to collaborative blogs where if students want to blog together, then they have to create their own Google Doc because they don't have that in Google Classroom, but they can share it with me if they want to work together. And so here you can see that our, our classrooms there and the shaded in part is of the world is where our blogs have been read. So it's neat to show that map to the kids so they know it's not just us, it's like all over the place. And then I show them this because Blogger actually collects the data of where the blogs are. Now, I'm not surprised that the United States is the top because that's where we are. But just to show kids, like, I don't know who lives in Germany, but people are reading our blogs, which is neat. And then I show them this. And since we started our blog, I think in 2016, we've had 91.3 thousand reads and 255 comments. And Blogger collects all this data for us. We have 1,287 posts, 91,284 views as of last week, 255 comments. And that's all from October of 2016. And so what I did was is it now is an assignment in class. They can use expository writing samples. They can use Google Keep to take notes if they want. They've collaborated with classmates and me, and then I created a Google reflection sheet so you can kind of see 
what students think, and I'm going to share that in a minute, but it's allowed students to take risks with their learning. It stretches their thinking and motivates them. It provides authentic purpose. It rele relieves the homework stress. Like they have, they, I don't give any other like ELA homework that week if they have a blog due. It creates partnerships and I get to build relationships and get to know the kids a lot better. It builds community and where we collaborate. And so just some of the things kids have said, just from the beginning of it, I chose to blog instead of regular homework because it's fun, because not only do other people learn things, but you do too. And here's someone that recognized I get to express my feelings and thoughts on the web and tell other people about it. Blogging helps me share original ideas about certain topics to my readers. I mean, the ownership of that, like my readers, I mean, they know they have readers. I love stating different opinions about different things because it lets people get to understand me better. It also lets you express emotions and ideas about certain topics. You can honestly talk about any topic that you find interesting in a blog because it shows emotion and feeling on a specified subject. That is a fifth grader. And that was just uh, collected data about why kids thought other kids should blog. So from the mouths of kids, because I can't bring them here at 1 a.m. So any questions about blogging? Or anything you're wondering about? I, I had a, a quick question. How yeah, long Shannon, go ahead. Um, for them, like start to finish, is that like you introduce, you know, you're going to do a blog this week on Monday and then by Friday it's posted to the blog? So I hand out the packet at the beginning of the year. We went over it in Google Classroom and they have two weeks to write this blog. So they have a blog due every other week and they have what I like to call a reading letter due every other week. So every Friday there's one ELA thing due. Mm -hmm. So they know that they have this blog due. Now they could do it two weeks before because the reading letter doesn't take long, right? So they could work on it every night. I do have a lot of kids that wait until Thursday night. And what I do tell them is I have a life and mm -hmm. I'm not gonna check your blog at nine o'clock at night. So if you choose to send your blog in on Thursday night at eight or nine o'clock because you forgot about it, you will be working on it the following week when you have a reading letter due because I have to give you feedback and now you're waiting for me. But right. it does, once I put the feedback in, it does not take them that long. And I find because the kids don't hand them in all at once, I am not spending hours doing blogs one night a week, if that makes sense. Like I might do like a couple a night mm -hmm. because they randomly come in. And I do, I have that one kid that submitted his two weeks early because grandma made him because he thought he had a blog due and he didn't. Yeah, so, and some, some that's great. Kids and then Google as well, um, Google Docs, like writing comments, I found to be a lot quicker than handwriting comments and you yep. know, really handwriting their notebook, so. Well, and does anyone here use Moat? Because I just started using Moat. So Moat is an extension and it shows up in all the Google tools. And what it, I'm hoping it doesn't do it right now, but what it allows me to do, there's something going on with my mic, but what it allows me to do is give audio feedback and then it transcribes it. So then if I want to give the audio feedback, they can listen to me or I can do, um, when it transcribes it, then I'm just looking at, did it transcribe it right? And maybe fixing a typo versus typing it all. So I have neuropathy from the chemo. So I like to look for tools that are gonna be a little bit better. Or we also, I have also used, um, I actually have a father who is blind and he likes to help his child. So I've used Kaizena, which is another extension to give audio feedback for the dad. So that way the kid clicks on, just like in Google, when this goes yellow, when I'm giving feedback, Kaizena also highlights. And he, the, the father tells his son to click on all the highlights and they listen to me together with the feedback. So there's audio, there's value in audio feedback. And I've learned too, that not all, like my parents want to help the kids and not all the parents have the, the same abilities. Thanks for asking. Does anyone have any other questions about blogging? It's a great thing to do with kids. I can't tell you how many things I've learned from my kids about things and what they do. Like, I don't know how many of you know what this Warhammer is. I had no idea, but I have a student who hates to write. And this is what he does. He makes like a photo journal and writes about it. He takes these pictures and he builds models. So he's been so inspired to do this. And then I said to him at the beginning, you can't just put pictures, where did you get them from? So he has, look at what he has at the bottom, where they're from. So you can see that he's learning. All right, 
Awesome. Podcasting. Get rid of all this. Hold on. I took my own link out. Okay. I'm going to try to get back to the chat so I can get my link out. It's here. Sorry, I closed too many tabs. I guess that happens. Welcome to the world of my Google Drive. Hey, Raina, I shared yeah. the link again in the chat. I can't see, I, the ch I don't even have the option with the chat, what I'm looking at right now. I don't see it okay. because I'm sharing my screen. So that's why I have to go find it. I know where it is though. It's right here. It's always good to know where your stuff is. <laughs> right, all right, here we go. Just because I'm working out of two Chromes, which is, because I want you to be able to see the kids work. Like that is this. Hopefully this works. No, all right, here we go. Sorry. There we go. All right, so the podcasting. So lead with courage, creating podcasts to build a community. So I work in a grade three to five school with 805 kids and over a hundred teachers. And my principal and I were talking because there's 23,000 people in the community. How do you shrink your school, right? Like how do you make it much smaller? Cause we do, we, we are the only grades three to five in the entire district. And I, when I first started, there were 16 teachers per grade and with budget cuts and enrollment drops, there's now 11 to 12. And he and I were talking and he was saying that like, you know, if you're podcasting as a leader, good communication is as stimulating as black coffee and just as hard. So we were trying to figure out entertaining ways to reach our audience because communication is important. So he and I had been talking about podcasting for a while. Um, we talked about, you know, tone and intent, like what kind of message do you want to send to community? We know that podcasting helped build a community. We were inspired to do it. We knew it was gonna shrink our school and I knew it was gonna be a way for me to get my students' voices out there. It's, we're able to lead as humans, but we kept coming back to what's our message and what do we want people to know? So he started talking and I just like to share this because this is kind of where my ideas came from, is he was talking about family communication and why podcast is a school. And he was talking about how he's seen people do school events, parent organizations, social skills curriculum, um, building community, curriculum vocabulary. Kids could talk about weather, history, biography. They're going to enhance their speaking and presentation skills. So I said to him, I want a podcast in my classroom. I want student voice live, like out there in the open. And I started to look at the SAMR model. And again, with the blogging, it's still, it's that redefinition piece because it's a, the tech is allowing us to do things that I could have never done before. And you can see here, students are still using the pencil and paper to write their podcast, but I knew that there had to be a way to do it. And I knew that it fit the ISTE standards. So what I started to think about is why am I gonna be podcasting? So I don't know how many of you have workbooks. I am not a workbook teacher. And one, about two, this is our second year. So three years ago in my school order form, they wanted to order these wordly wise vocabulary workbooks, which are like no different than what I had in the sixth grade. And it was like painful for me. So I went down to the office and I said, is it expected that we order these workbooks? And they said, they don't know what's coming from the superintendent. And I said, well, if it's expected, order them for me. And if it's not expected, don't waste the taxpayer's dollars on my class's workbooks. Well, I show up in the fall and there is a box of workbooks in my classroom. And no joke, I wanted to like throw up in my mouth because I was trying to figure out how can I use this in an engaging way. So I called my principal down to the room and I asked him if I was expected to use the workbook in its entirety, like exercise to exercise. And he says to me, what are you thinking? Where are you going with this? And I said, I think I want a podcast with the wordly wise words. And he said, what do you mean? I said, let the kids learn the vocabulary, but then they have to put a certain amount of them into a podcast. So he was like, all right, let's try this. Let's see if it works. And that's how this seed 
was born. I wanted to create an authentic experience that builds community around a workbook that I didn't want to use. And so how did I start? I researched podcast programs. My principal was using Podbean. He podcasts our morning announcements. I looked at Eric with Anchor, Bukaru, Audacity, Soundtrap, and Twisted Wave. And I will say Audacity is great, but the paid version is way too much for out of my pocket. And Anchor was amazing and free and a proof tool that I could use in my district. So I settled on Anchor. I spoke to colleagues across the country and I asked for permission to do this. I didn't just do it out of thin air. It was student driven, it was student designed, it was student created and it was student reflected and refined. And what I mean by that is I said to the kids, we're gonna be doing a podcast. We're gonna be using your Wordly Wise book. We're going to be, I started off with doing three sets of stories, which I learned was too much. There's um, 15 words per story. So what I have them do now is two stories and eight to 10 words from each of the topics that we're doing. And I asked the kids three years ago, well, what do you want our podcast to be called? And we had this whole class like brainstorming session and we narrowed it down and narrowed it down. And the kids came down to day in the life of a fifth grader and a top 10. And we did this whole debate, the pro con pro, the opening argument, the closing argument. And what the kids came to realize is through their debate is that if they did a top 10 list, they would have never been able to engage with words and as many of the words that they could have. So they decided to do the day in the life of a fifth grader and they were gonna talk about anything they wanted to, for us to get to know them. And so what we did was is the kids worked and you can see they had notebooks here when we first started. So they ended up starting with notebooks and then you can see there's, if you can see it, there's a little microphone and I had a Mac here and I had the kids line up and literally one group after another read into this. And that did not work again, like my blogging epic failure, right? Like we were all having to be quiet. It was too long. The papers were crinkling. So I actually did a donors choose project and ended up getting some eye touches and some microphones and some stuff donated and then I ended up buying what was missing. And with the eye touch and a microphone, they can record right into a voice memo. The device is not hooked up to the internet at all. So it's totally safe and they record in this voice memo and then I take the voice memo and upload it right to Anchor. Because you can do it right from the eye touch, which is great. So we learned that flow is important. The kids then realized that if they wrote it in note cards and sketch noted things, they could figure out if they didn't have it organized well, how to reorganize it by moving the note cards around. So they use sketch noting as a visual thinking tool. And then we figured out that if we used voice memos, they could practice and practice and practice until they decided that they um, had what they wanted. Then when we went to the digital world of this year, I realized that I couldn't do paper and pencil and I was going to have kids at home and at school at the same time. So I had to go digital. So what I did was, is I made this podcast planning packet and all the kids work off this one slide deck. I changed the orientation to be an eight and a half by 11 paper. I made a section for group one and then just copied and pasted the slides for the other five groups. So I talked about what your podcast needs to include. You have to focus around something on the life of a fifth grader, use at least eight to 10 vocabulary words from each lesson covered and all student voices must be included. They then had to brainstorm their ideas. So these kids wanted to do a podcast about school lunch. They then had to put on their you know, their 50, 16 to 20 words they were going to use. And I told them they can change the words. Um, they have to decide on a few norms to help their group be successful. We talked about what norms were. They highlighted the vocabulary words. They let me know when they were done so they, I could give them feedback. And then once their podcast is complete, they practice reading the podcast. And we learned that when they're recording it and kids are at home and kids are at school, you can still do it from the Meet. It totally works right from the Google Meet. I encourage them to use note cards to storyboard their ideas. I tell them to give themselves permission to change vocabulary words if they realize they don't fit. They should listen to their group mates. They don't include any information that identifies their full name and location. They ask for help if their group needs it. Don't sit around and wait and think about voice when recording. 
once you type your podcast, color code who is reading what. So then I put this intro so that way it was the same. It was uniform each episode. So welcome to the day in the life of a fifth grader. And then the students, it says I am, and then the student has to put their name. And then I am blank, they put their name. Today we're going to talk about, and they're talking about fifth grade lunch. I am Sarah, we are glad you've joined us. And I am Dominic, this pod podcast is sponsored by our teacher, Miss Friedman, because that's who's doing the legwork. And then here you can see they've already color coded it by who's reading what. But welcome to the day in the life of a fifth grader. Today, we're going to talk about fifth grade lunch. This year and lunch is a little different. A couple of lunch monitors have retired last year. Retired is one of their vocabulary words. When we enter the cafeteria, here's another one. Aroma of pizza fills the room. And the aroma distracts is another one. Us for moving up the line. We wait patiently in line to get our food. The lunch monitors say we are obedient. There's another one of their words for waiting in line. So what you're starting to see is now I understand these kids actually know how to use these words. It wasn't just the workbook. We did some of the exercises in the workbook, but they know how to do it. And then they have a closing that they all read together. And then at the same slides for group two and group two wrote about video games in their first podcast. Group three wrote, did a girl has a bully in her class and she does not know how to deal with it. And group four decided on how school is different and how online school works. And I have, I think I have six groups. They did a newscast like COVID. And then the last group did how to write a blog and a DQ, how to prepare for their projects. So it's really things that they're interested in. That's been great to hear them. So now if I go to show you what we do, it's posted in my family portal. And then the nice thing about Anchor is it goes to all these places. So I just put it on Anchor and once I publish it, it goes. So here is an example. Welcome to the day. Can you hear it? Yes. So I just want to remind you that this is an example of one done where kids were in school and other kids were at home. So the sound isn't going to be 100% perfect, but it works, just like Taylor Swift recorded her album Hello, from her bedroom. Let's introduce ourselves. I'm Ricardo. I am Tyler. Today we are going to be talking about how school is different. I am the one. We're, we're glad you have joined us. Hello, I'm Sarah. I'm Today we're going to be talking about school at home and how it is different when we go in. So first we're going to be talking about online school. Next we'll talk about in school and how it's different. Let's talk about online school. We have to get accustomed to login in the class. In the meet with your companions, Miss Friedman assigns us a touch of luck and going for goals on Friday. After we look at what the teacher has on the meet, and we do that until morning meeting. Morning meeting is a time when the morning meeting host does whatever they want, and you do whatever is on the agenda. We do a special thing. We look at the agenda hub until the end of the day. Sometimes during writing, we go and take notes. We combine the kids at home with the kids at school. We are not always compatible, but we still work well. And the one thing I love about this is these kids are primary sources for this pandemic, right? So here's like a total example of them talking about the difference between school and there. And, you know, I was worried about the sound with the kids at home, but I think for me, for fifth grade, it sounds pretty good, especially with how we made it work. And then what was fun was the students started a blog about podcasting. And about how we ended up with the podcast we ended up with. So the students are taking ownership of their work. And so one of the things that I started to do was look at ways for the kids to really learn these words. So pre-pandemic, we could do headbands where they had the word on their head and a headband and the kids could like figure out what the words mean. Um, we've done Pictionary, Sketchnoting, Flashcard Factory, and Pear Deck is great if you're looking for a flashcard tool. Um, we've done Brain Pop, Make a Movie, and um, in year two last year, obviously school closed. So what I decided to do while the kids were home was I offered to still continue the podcast and I called kids and they did it on speakerphone. 
and we they got interviewed about COVID and school closing and they talked about things they wanted to do. So we stopped using the words because obviously we weren't at school, but the idea of the podcast and still sharing our story was still there. And then in year three, like I said, I showed you that podcast planning thing and I gave you um, a copy off my site in case you wanna use that. So that's there. And then this just shows you all of our listeners and the data that Anchor shares. So it's nice like blogger that Anchor shares the data. You can see the different types of ones that are listened more than others. I can show the kids where our podcast is being played and on which platforms. So they record their podcast. So you got to choose whatever tool you're going to want to use. You're going to share your podcast. You're going to choose how you want to share it and then promoting it. So I'm always emailing it to families and putting it on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. And there's different tools, obviously, to record your podcast. And just to kind of show you, let me go back in here. I wonder if it will work. Yeah. So Anchor, right? When you go in as the teacher, when the kids do it on the iTouch, it shows up right here in the library. You just drag it and then hit save episode. And then it takes you to, I'm not going to really save it because I don't want them to do it, but it will take you to a page that just asks you to title it. And then asks you, you know, how, what episode number it is if you want. You can also record right in Anchor itself if you wanted to use Anchor as your recording. We use voice memos only because the kids can listen to it. And that was the kid's idea. Like, I need a way to hear myself. And that made me realize that I could actually use voice memos for fluency practice. So when families are like, how can I support my kids' fluency? It's like, have them record on some kind of recording tool. Because whatever they don't like, they can hit the trash button. The other nice thing about Anchor is it has its own music and songs you can use that are totally okay to share. And it has transitions. So if you wanna put funny transitions in, it's got the musical interludes for you. So if you wanna make them fancy, you can. And, and then when you're looking at your dashboard, I can't, there's so many things going on on this page. But when you're looking at your dashboard, it looks like this and you can actually click how to share it right from Anchor which is a great tool. And then it also has like all your data. So we've had 928 plays and we've had 15 people listen recently, which is great. And like I said, these are where I got the pictures. This I find interesting. It started calculating, I don't know how it knows, but the gender, but I thought it was interesting that they've just added the non-binary. So for me, that's huge because I have my first transgendered male student this year. And I like to use things that you know, promote things like that so I can show him. I also love that the, the uh, average age of people listening are actually not my students, but 35 to 44 year olds, which is neat. And then if I go to the public site, it looks just like this and then people can come and play. So it's, you know, it's super easy and user friendly, which is nice. Again, you have to figure out how you want to share it and then how you want to promote it. And I put in some links that we sort of use to get us started in case you were looking for additional resources. And so that's what I had to share about podcasting. And so I didn't know if anyone had any questions about that, but it's like having your own radio show with your kids. Let's stop sharing. There we go. Sorry, I actually did have a, another question. Um, yeah. So if you had, you had some kids in school, some kids were at home. How did you get them to record so that you, all of that was on the same recording? Was somebody calling through the phone and they're on speaker? How did you get no, all so What do you use? Like, are your kids on a Google Meet or Zoom? Yeah, we do Zoom. All right, so just like this, right? The kids that are in school, so they have, do they have a Chromebook or some kind of device? They that, all have their own device. Yeah, they bring their own devices to school. Okay, so I had one device. The kids were in, we have breakout groups in our Google Meet. So they were in, a, in a, their own little breakout group. So say there were four or five kids in this group. They went into just either the hallway or there's um, some teachers that are teaching remotely across the hall for me. So the classroom's empty. So mm -hmm. I'd send them into there and they'd have the two kids just like this, right? And yeah. then they would take the eye touch. They would have the voice memo that they would go into. So 
So you're there. All right, do me a favor, start talking. Hello, I'm Ms. Shannon. I'm gonna talk about how today's PD went. Okay, so now. Do me a favor, start talking. Hello, I'm Ms. Shannon. I'm gonna talk about how today's PD went. See? Okay. Easy that's PD. What, yep, that's what we did. And then they could, then the kids at home and the kids at school could still listen to it in the playback. What was funny was they're like, it's not playing back. And what they've had to figure out was they ha I have mics that are plugged into the USB at the bottom because they're a little bit older. They had to unplug the microphone to actually hear their um, recording. But they could all hear it and decide if they didn't want it or not, which was great too, because the kids at home, it didn't matter where the kids were. Yeah, they can delete and start over. Yep, or keep it and then pick the one they want. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much yep. for that. You're welcome. And then I see that someone asked about blogging. Do students submit the script on Google Classroom and then you will post on the blogger? Yes. So they actually type it in a Google Doc that I made a um, template for. So all their blogs are on one Google Doc. And then I copy and paste it and put it on blogger because I don't want my kids on that. They're too young. And I do know people that have done a Reader's Club or a podcast. Yep. And I did it in grades three and four and five. So it works. And I think you could do it with kindergartners. They have a lot to say at five. And if anyone has any questions or like looks at this and wants to know how to do something, I will totally let you know. So, Raina, thank you yes. so much for this fantastic AN workshop. And thank you, everyone, for being here. And I hope, uh, we hope, BTC, I hope that you enjoy, you take a lot of insight and thanks to doing your classrooms. And thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone.